the first speaker at Scott E3's Glasgow meeting on stopping North Sea oil and gas was Ryan Morrison from Friends of the Air Scotland. As Mike said, I'm Ryan, I'm Just Transition Campaigner for Friends of the Air Scotland. Um, I didn't have a banner, so I can just tell you that we are the leading environmental campaigning charity in Scotland. Um, and I'm here to talk to you today about our new report, Sea Change, um, that was written in conjunction with Platform, um, Oil Change International, uh, and is endorsed by a few other organisations as well. Uh, basically, there are plenty of studies that people have seen that sort of explain the need to keep uh, significant amounts of fossil fuel reserves in the ground um, to avoid catastrophic global warming. Um, our report, this report, Sea Change, took that to another stage and basically took the Paris Agreement goals of limiting global warming to 1.5 degrees as a framework to look against what that means in terms of global fossil fuel extraction and UK fossil fuel extraction. Um, so to talk to you through the report, uh, I'm going to show and explain some of the key findings. Uh, it might get fairly techy. Uh, there are quite a few graphs and I will do my best to avoid using um, acronyms and certain terms that might not, might not necessarily be as obvious as they seem. Um, so if I do use any, feel free to just interrupt me, just wave a hand, I'm happy to try and uh, explain what they mean as we go. Uh, just yeah, give me a wave. Um, so, crucially what the report finds is that um, oil and gas in the UK's already developed reserves is enough to exceed our fair share of emissions under our 1.5 degrees global warming pathway. So that means to stay within the Paris Agreement goal of 1.5, the oil and gas and already deserved res and developed reserves must stay in the ground, some of those. Um, now, despite this, both the Scottish and UK governments, um, as well as the oil and gas industry, support a policy of ma max maximising economic recovery, uh, and that's the first acronym I could use, I'll just call that MER. Um, what MER means is basically through developing existing fields and expo exploration for new fields, we will take every last drop. Um, out of the North Sea. So, in developed reserves currently in the UK, uh, we're looking at around 5.7 billion barrels of oil and gas, uh, and that's the number of which we're talking about. So, we need to not extract that number, we need to stay within that number for the UK to do a fair share of contributing to 1.5 degrees. Now, through pursuing maximum MER, we're talking about 20 billion barrels. So, this is way beyond a safe limit. Um, it's way beyond two degrees. It's significantly higher than a fair share for the UK. So that's the that's the headline. I'm just going to go through some of the graphs now. Um, so to start off with, um, what do I mean when I say des developed reserves? Uh, so these reserves are sites where infrastructure is built. The wall wells are drilled or are already under construction. Um, and this slide shows you the global context of developed reserves. So what you can see there is that first small red circle is oil and gas in those existing sites. What you can see in the slightly larger circle is those areas that we know about, um, that we haven't yet got the site set up to extract. Um, and then in the even bigger resources circle, what you can see is what, what resources are known and recoverable um, with future technology. So, we are talking about, in this context, limiting extraction to that red circle. That the first small red circle, sorry, the colours aren't particularly clear. Um, and the big light orange circle is partly what may be recoverable one day in terms of technology, um, but is all part of uh, the maximising economic recovery. That includes things like shale gas and fracking. There. Now, this next graph, uh, shows how those global developed reserves, that little, the little red circle, relate to a 1.5 and 2 degree target within the Paris Agreement. Um, so what we can see in the developed reserves is that these go significantly beyond a 1.5 degree pathway. Um, sorry, I might be mistelling you. <coughs> So, what you can see here is that the developed reserves far outstrip a 50% chance of avoiding the 1.5 degree. That's the IPCC and Paris uh, IPCC report. You can see that the 1.5 degree 50% chance. So, that's only a 50% chance of that safe pathway. That's not even a guaranteed chance. It's not even more than a flip of a coin. It's 
Um, again, looking at the global levels, what you're looking at here is what happens if you put oil and gas extraction against a 1.5 degree pathway. And what you can see is that extraction using existing fields only, that's not pursuing any further extraction, uh, runs fairly close to that demand for 1.5 degrees. It's not quite there, that's where we're talking about staying within that, but what you can see is it's sort of carrying on in that trend. And what you can see across the top in the red line, that's business as usual. That's um, continuing along MER lines, that's continued exploration and continued development of um, currently not functioning sites. Please tell me if I'm going too fast as well, I feel like I might be. No? Okay. So taking that, that global, global context back into the UK, and what you can see here is a projection of carbon dioxide emissions from UK oil and gas sort of between now, 2018, and 2015. Uh, again, the colours are hopefully clear enough. That first black block is uh, projected emissions from currently producing sites. The slightly lighter, the grey one, is those under development where we're trying to build up the functioning uh, infrastructure. And you can see, if you look, if you just compare this slightly to the 1.5 degrees pathway in the only field, in the existing fields, you see as they seem to be on a similar trend. So that's just letting things in existing fields run out. That's the 5.7 billion barrels we're talking about in the UK. But what you can see in the red is what happens when you start to look at the undeveloped and the undiscovered sites. And that's significantly higher. It peaks around 20, 2031, 2032 in terms of emissions but it's way off course, um, this 1.5 degree pathway. So that's the context of emissions and what we're looking at in terms of UK sites and the, the global context of oil and gas. <coughs> but, um, the report also looked at subsidies that have been given to the oil and gas industry in the UK. Um, and essentially the conclusion is that in pursuit of MER, the UK government has given quite outrageously generous tax breaks and subsidies to these industries um, and in tax years of 2015 to 2016 and 2016 to 2017 the Treasury gave more money to oil and gas than it took from them back in embassies. Um, yeah. So the additional oil and gas extraction that you can see uh, here, that, so that first orange block, the subsidies and support since 2014, that shows the number, the amount of emissions that have been created as a direct result of, this, of the subsidies and support that um, the Treasury has given to the oil and gas industry. And what we're comparing it against here is what was saved in emissions from the coal phase out. Uh, so the, the last coal site in Scotland um, was phased out in 2016 and it was held as a really significant moment in reducing our emissions. But what, what this basically shows is that, that the phase out of that site has effectively more than doubled and the, through the subsidies given to oil and gas um, since 2014. And then above that, the red, where we get even higher, is what the government ambition is um, and where those further subsidies are likely to take us in the future in terms of emission, which is just again continuing higher and higher beyond what we've saved in coal phase out. Um, and yeah, just for context, what we mean by subsidies is tax allowances, tax breaks, reduced tax rates, as well as decommissioning funding things like that. Um, compared to Norway, the UK Treasury has missed out on £250 billion since 1990 by consistently under-taxing the, the oil industry in the UK. So let's name names. Who are we talking about? Uh, this chart is looking at between 2015 and 2017, uh, the lack of tax take for the top 10. Um, and you can sort of have a look at those yourselves with Centrica and um, BHP bill at the sort of far end if you can't see those. Um, at least five of these ten made profits in these years. And what you can see is that they were given, I mean in the BP context, there's almost £600 million worth of subsidies against what they were given in the taxes. That's the net that we received back in. BP and ExxonMobil made more than £1 billion in profit in these periods while taking this much money from the UK Treasury to continue looking for it. Um, and operating UK oil and gas. A generous bunch. So there's good news. Um, we wouldn't do this report without any good news. We've also looked at job creation. 
and uh, two clean energy sectors um, and renewables and home energy retrofits. We've looked at those sectors where there are the most transferable skills for the people working in oil and gas currently. Um, and we've looked at the number of jobs that would need replacing in a managed phase out of extraction, taking account of any jobs that might come from decommissioning existing oil sites and uh, potential retirements and things like that. So there are three, three scenarios up here. We've got current, current trajectory, which is uh, what we're looking at at the moment on current ambition and policies. Um, sorry, not ambitions, current policies. You've got second set, which is existing ambitions. This is what governments say they're going to make happen. Um, and then we've also got the fully, fully renewable scenario by, 20, uh, by 2050. And this shows the level of job creation we're talking about. So what you can see is that in terms of existing ambitions, the home retrofits, there's an awful lot of talk from the, Scottish, from the government in terms of the potential jobs we can see from that. But in terms of current trajectory, that's not going to happen. Um, under a fully renewable scenario, there are significantly um, higher jobs, particularly in the, the latter part of uh, the 2030s and the 2040s, um, in areas mostly around onshore winds um, and offshore winds. So, uh, this chart shows shows those three <laughs> this chart shows those three trajectories for job creation next to the number of oil and gas workers um, that are at risk. Um, but it also looks at the total decrease in oil and gas jobs due to retirement, things like that. So what you can see is the current trajectory replaces the jobs at risk, but it doesn't cover the decrease in jobs. And the current trajectory is your black line running across there, and then that dashed orange line is running up to about 100,000. Um, and then what you can also see is the blue line and the existing ambition is showing you if if the policies were to come forward from the government in line with what they are saying they would like to achieve, that's what we're looking at. And then in a fully renewable situation, we're talking about there being uh, three jobs for every one job at risk um, in the North Sea. So the key findings, um, the UK's 5.7 billion barrels of oil and gas will exceed our contribution in relation to the Paris Climate Goals. Uh, despite this, the government and industry aim to extract 20 billion barrels. That policy of maximising maximizing extraction is set in legislation through the 2015 Infrastructure Act. Um, and the additional oil and gas extraction enabled by recent subsidies will add twice as much carbon as the phase out of coal power has saved or will save. Um, but also that given the right policies, clean industries could create more than three jobs for every North Sea job at risk, which means we could enable an equivalent job guarantee for every oil worker, so that's ensuring that the skills that those workers have are able to be pulled across into the renewable industry and that those workers and communities who depend on those industries but haven't been involved in the process of taking huge subsidies from the Treasury while posting huge profits. Uh, they've not seen those benefits, um, but they should see these benefits. So what are we asking the UK and Scottish governments to do? Well, we want them, first of all, to stop issuing licences and permits for new exploration. Um, this isn't, that isn't even about those existing 5.7 barrels. This is just, please stop looking for more sites. Um, there's another licensing round, the 32nd licensing round will take place in November, where <coughs> lots of companies will vie with one another to get access to different parts of the country, seabed, to be able to go and search for these things. Um, we also want to rapidly see a rapid phase out of the subsidies for oil and gas extraction, including tax breaks, um, and these should be redirected towards funding a just transition. Um, I haven't explained just transition, so that's obviously my job title. <laughs> when we say just transition, what we're talking about is moving from a fossil, a fossil fuel dependent economy to a zero carbon economy in a way that's fair to workers and communities currently dependent on those industries. Um, so. That's going to take funding, that's going to take government intervention. And rather than funding further exploration, rather than giving many, many millions more uh, profit towards those top ten, um, we should be redirecting that government support towards funding the just transition. We also want to see a rapid building of the clean energy industry through fiscal and policy support to at least the extent provided to the oil industry, including inward investment in affected regions and communities. There's, um, from the first 
uh, drop of North Sea oil and gas that was extracted. It took 16 years for the United Kingdom to become the fifth biggest um, extractor of oil and gas. That's the, that was thanks to huge levels of government support, huge levels of government subsidy. It is possible to make these transitions really rapidly, um, if given the right intervention by government. We also want to see formal consultations with trade unions, who should be at the core of any plan for just transition, to develop and implement a strategy for all dependent regions and communities. And then, in light of what we, I started talking about, around um, how those existing barrels fit into the 1.5 degrees pathway, pathway um, we want to see oil and gas policy in the UK aligned with these Paris, Paris goals in a much more formal way. Um, doing that would see a cap, like an immediate cancellation to current and future licensing grounds. Um, it would mean revoking undeveloped licences and reviewing whether existing operations should be phased out early. Um, the Scottish Government is equally as supportive as, of maximising economic recovery of the North Sea oil and gas. It's included in their 2017 energy strategy. They're um, fully supportive of the industry and pursuing that. Uh, so we'd also want to see the Scottish Government taking that out of their energy strategy and ending support for maximising economic recovery. Um, and despite the protestations, uh, we would like the Scottish Government to put a proper ban to fracking um, into legislation and uh, also to ban future licensing of any onshore oil and gas. Um, so in terms of subsidies, uh, these are obviously the more direct Debt to talking about tax relief and things like that, so that's decommissioning relief deeds. Um, the UK government, Westminster MPs in Westminster, passed the policy that would see um, some oil and gas companies not responsible for clearing up their mess at the end on these rigs. Uh, they can effectively see uh, even more subsidies at the stage of decommissioning. They can continue to extract and extract and extract to get to a point um, where there is nothing left in those sites and they will be free from any tax burden at that point. Meaning they get all of the profit in the meantime and none of the tax happening. Um, we also think the UK government should require companies to uh, put decommissioning plans in place and to show how they are going to ensure transit there will be a just transition for workers. And we want to see huge investment in the clean economy. Those those uh, graphs you've seen that talked about the fully renewable scenario against existing ambitions, that, that will take significant investment. Um, and that's going to take concerted fiscal and policy effort um, as well as providing support at least to the extent the oil and gas industry has received with the aim of meeting energy needs and creating decent work. So this should include investment uh, and public sector participation. We're talking about national and regional investment banks, ownership of renewables and support for local supply chains. Um, and the UK and Scottish Government should support major scaling up of education retraining and reskilling to help workers succeed in new industries. Um, it's particularly timely at the moment because on Thursday there will be the first um, debate in the Scottish Parliament on the Scottish National Investment Bank uh, at the minute that's currently likely to get around about £10 billion worth of public money over the next 10 years um, and at the minute, minute it doesn't mention the legislation to create it, doesn't mention climate change once. Um, that's critical uh, ensuring a just transition that that is put in as a central mission because at the, at the moment there is nothing to stop the Scottish National Investment Bank investing in further fossil fuel infrastructure locking us into yet more carbon uh, emissions. <coughs> we also want to enable a just transition for workers and communities. So this will require huge strategic planning. Um, it will need to be guided by climate limits. Um, and it must be accountable to communities, to trade unions, and to local stakeholders. And it should also come with a guarantee to protect workers' livelihoods, to safeguard those. Um, this should be done on a regional basis. That we, are, we know where significant amounts of these work are, and we know where significant amounts of this work can go. Um, and so this will take specific regional plan planning to deliver. Um, and we should also see the UK and Scottish Government ensuring offshore renewable projects are designed to maximise the transferability of oil and gas workers um, with equivalent terms and conditions. Uh, and I think that is me. We have a petition at the minute to tell the UK and Scottish Government no new oil and gas. This is about asking them to end the continued exploration um, 
and so I can give you a link to that presentation or um, you can find it on our website at www.fo.scot. I'm happy to answer any questions, I appreciate yeah. it very much.